This is Vadim Krasnovoki, Media Center Ukraine. I'm welcoming all journalists uh, who are here in order to share the truth about the most important issues in Ukraine and events of Ukraine. Melpomene Tavria. So that's a very renowned festival that has been um, organized since uh, 1990s and uh, has never been cancelled. Most likely, we are going to have it this year as well, but it's unlikely that we will have it in Kherson unless they manage to regain the city by then. I'd like to present uh, Alexander Kniha, Art Director at Mykola Kulish Academic Music and Drama Theatre of Kherson Oblast. You decided to organize the festival this year as well. What does that mean for you? It means that I'm optimistic and I hope that on June the 10th we will be able to organize the festival in Kherson. And that's my message to all those people who stayed there and who are in very difficult conditions. I've been in Kherson for 40 days and I know firsthand what it takes and what it feels like. We have the hope to organize this festival. And first of all, this is the message to Kherson and Kherson people, because it's a um, very important event for our city, our region. Yesterday night, uh, uh, we said that uh, Melpomena Tavria is uh, the voice of Kherson. We want to make sure this voice is heard. Uh, you've seen that uh, six countries joined uh, this festival. They participated uh, in previous years and they are going to organize performances in their cities and countries. Melpomena cannot be stopped, even by the war, because art is something that people need today. Should Kherson be deoccupied before June, does that mean that this festival is going to be organized in Kherson and you will have uh, participants from other cities, other countries? Do you think you will manage to prepare uh, and organize everything. As I said, I'm optimistic, but I'm reasonably optimistic. This year we decided to organize this festival in an alternative uh, mode, even if Kherson is deoccupied, and I do hope it will one day. But logistics and funding the festival, that's another issue. Besides organi organi um, organizational resource, you also need to have logistical and funding resources. That's why every theater who wants to participate in this uh, festival, so they can apply, but they will perform in their theaters, in their countries, but also they are obliged to organize press conferences, uh, share this information in social networks, making sure that they mention that this is within the framework of Melpomena Tavria festival, so that we do not give up on Kherson. Because you understand that counter-propaganda of Russia is a very powerful tool. Some people say that Kherson is no longer Ukraine, is a, a republic, it's an, a republic or it's going to join um, some other republics. But you know that Kherson is Ukraine and people of Kherson so par who participated in protests and rallies, who were dismissed by rubber bullets, by flashbangs, they proved that they deserve to be citizens of our country, and Kherson is the city of heroes. And you know our legendary Chornobayevka, when we are trying to crack jokes amidst uh, sad times, we say that Kherson is next door to Chornobayevka. It's basically the suburb of Chornobayevka. It's important for Kherson people, it's important for the whole of Ukraine. Uh, your theater is temporarily based in Lviv, Partially. Uh, some people left um, 
um, they now are living everywhere in Ukraine and some of them um, got relocated abroad. Some of them stayed in Kherson. We will keep their uh, location in secret because they are trying to to keep working, but you understand that the theater is not a movie, so you cannot just turn on the movie and enjoy watching it. Theater is a big organism, and uh, in order to make this organism work, so you need a lot of efforts. I'm pleased uh, to see some people who are um, on our staff, our staff members, but they are not based in Lviv, but they decided to come to Lviv for this particular event. We stay in touch. Uh, yesterday, for example, I talked to security who are making sure that, uh, that the theater is safe and secure. Serhii Pavluk, who is our producer, who is now in Kyiv, he managed to leave Kherson amongst the last uh, people who had a chance to leave the city when it was still possible. We even rehearse online. And I think that on day one, when Kherson is deoccupied and liberated, we will have a performance. If Kherson is still occupied by the 10th of June and the festival will be organized online, is that is my understanding correct that all participants will be performing uh, where they are based? Uh, what about you, your theater? I have a hope that we will be performing in Kherson. If not, then we will record our performance. But we do hope that it's going to be in Kherson. Do you think it's going to be, it might be in Lviv? Well, decorations, people, all these things, uh, it's, it's a lot of efforts. We cannot do it in Lviv. I understand. So you are going to coordinate the whole event. That is correct. Some theaters are even offering to send us the video version of their performance. So, and we will have uh, the link to all of those resources. They will be on YouTube of our theater channel, on other resources. If possible, we will be broadcasting live. Given the circumstances, it might be difficult. We know that in Kherson region there are issues with communication and uh, internet connection. There are challenges, of course, but I am absolutely positive that people of Kherson will be able to see what we do for their support and for their sake and for them. You saw war firsthand with your own eyes, so and you saw the Russian occupation in Kherson. What? What is um, your feeling and wh what do you make of it? Uh, I've been asked by journalists um, many times um, what I feel about that. It, it's not only about the food that is not available in grocery stores. It's not about the medication that is not available when you need it there and then. Uh, it's hard to realize that you are living under pressure, constant pressure. I left Kherson after one month, uh, one month after the war started, because my home was visited by many armed people. They were searching for something in my home. There were also members of regional parliament were affected. Um, we were organizing dozens of rallies, dozens of protests. I myself did not participate in all of them because I was physically located on the left bank of the Dniester River and physically I couldn't get to where the rallies were. But the worst feeling was when you just walk along the street of your city and you feel from behind that the car drives up. If it's a car with a Z letter, then it's even more scary. It sends shivers down your spine. Now the situation is really dire in Kherson because uh, they check every person, they check their phones, they check their information. So imagine you live in your city, in your country, but you are not free to do what you want. And that's the hardest thing because it's moral pressure, it's psychological pressure. 
and I want to make sure that the voice of Kherson is heard. It's heard on different levels, including the level of art and the level of theater. So that's our most important message. We heard you and we hope that your message is going to be powerful and it's going to be heard both in Kherson and uh, all over Ukraine. We have another guest in our studio today, Andriy Matsak, Director General of Maria Zenkovetska National Theatre, Lviv. Welcome. It's an honor for people from Zankovetska Theatre to provide assistance to our dear friend Alexander and uh, the festival Melpomene of Tavria. We as uh, Lviv Theatre and um, the Theatre of Western Ukraine, we are going to participate in this festival. We are going to perform because we want to honor this wonderful brand, this wonderful festival, Melpomene of Tavria. Uh, then Zenkovetska Theater is going to perform Kansandra by Lysa Ukrainka and uh, Life PS. That's military performance. I'm sure that most of you have seen this performance already. Let me reiterate again that for myself personally and for our theater, we are honored to have a chance to help our friends. That's why um, I feel for them. I'm really sorry about what they have been through and are going through. I feel for all people of Kherson and all Ukrainians who are now in occupied territories. But I cannot but express my pride by what I see and what our citizens demonstrate in such heart-wrenching times. Myself and Alexander, we are 100% positive that soon, very soon, thanks to our armed forces, our vo warriors, our volunteers, our great people, we are going to liberate all our cities and uh, um, our theaters will get back to work and will be performing. Why Lviv became the shelter for Kherson um, Theatre Festival? We've been friends with Alexander for years, for decades, I'd say. And Alexander is um, a brilliant leader uh, of, this, of his theatre. And he's the founder of this festival. Uh, Kherson Theatre is a modal theatre, for me personally. So we once got together and we talked and uh, we had this idea so that we can organize this festival this way. So that we do not interrupt it, we do not suspend it, so, but we make it happen. The theater of Maria Zenkovetska, they, you participated in uh, this festival earlier as well. Not always. Sometimes uh, there were issues um, and uh, that, that stopped us from participating, but we did participate several times. I understand that this is your personal friendly relationships and the friendship between the theaters probably make it happen, right? Because it takes uh, personal relationships and uh, creative relationships to make this whole thing happen. Do we have questions? Irina Tuzhinova, Ukrainian theater. I have a question for Alexander. Do you get funding? Um, I mean, do your staff, your actors get funding and uh, salaries? And how do you support your actors, your um, staff, your employees? So that's question number one. And question number two, we do understand that uh, you're optimistic and you already presented uh, uh, your optimistic scenario. But what about pessimistic scenario? In 2014, we lost two theaters in Donetsk region because they were not evacuated timely. Um, 
theater evacuation. Did you raise this issue? Who should have evacuated this, this theater? I understand it can't be you because it's uh, too um, labor consuming, time consuming, etc. So how can you manage evacuate the theater? Your question number one, so we do pay salaries to our staff. Um, sometimes it's a little bit delayed in time, but uh, today I got promises from our treasury and we are going to pay salaries for April. We understand that our regional treasury was also working on the ground. Now they are evacuated. I can't disclose their location. You also know that there were issues with connection with internet. Uh, some cables were damaged. I am not very good at it, but I know that there were issues. But I stay in touch with the governor, with the deputy governor, who are still in Kherson region, and uh, we are trying to make sure that our employees get their compensation. Sometimes we ask them to wait because um, we, we understand even if they get their salaries. So uh, the question is, how can they use it? Uh, because it's Ukrainian currency that they are getting. So it's a, it's a challenging process. Your second question about evacuation. We've been uh, informed, we've been warned, uh, we've been scared, but we didn't know that the city will be occupied. I remember that when the war started, we just decided to make a plan. We opened a bomb shelter for our employees just in case something happens so that we have somewhere to hide. But you know that uh, day two of the war, there were 70 people who were hiding in the shelter. So there were um, employees of the theater, there were just citizens of Kherson. You know that um, the suburbs of Kherson were affected first, and there were buildings that were damaged. The city of Kherson was affected later. But this, um, the, the Russian troops came to search inside the theater to do the search warrant, and you know that I was detained. And uh, uh, some people, after that, uh, they had to leave, so they were too scared to stay there. Um, another thing, why we organize this festival in Lviv? First of all, let me express my sincere gratitude to all theaters of Lviv, not only Zankovetska theater, because when we got together, so... Um, all of them said, yes, we, you have our supporting hand and supporting shoulder. You understand that not all theaters are now open and are working. So theaters in Chernihiv, in Poltava are closed because they are still shelled. But 90% of the theaters of Ukraine that still work, when, once they got to know that the festival is going to be organized, they all applied to participate. Moreover, Mariupol Theater is going to participate. They are temporarily based in Ujhorod. We talked to their representative yesterday. There is an acting director, and they are trying to um, resume the work of their theater. So most likely they are going to offer either a performance or maybe some kind of short show. Um, I was in Mariupol uh, last year before the New Year's Eve. There was um, a festival there and I was inspired by this city. When I came home, I said, it's a wonderful city. They have fountains, they have beautiful uh, theater, uh, beautiful surroundings. We started making some changes into our theater. If we had a chance, uh, if we all had a chance to come to Kherson and see this festival, you would also be inspired. Another reason why we decided to organize this festival in Lviv, when I was much younger, I visited Lviv um, when you organized Golden Line Festival. I envied you back then, and, but I promised myself that I'm going to organize a similar festival in Kherson. You know that there was a... Um, renowned festival Tavriski Ihre, Tavria Games in Kherson. And I remember that I approached Mr. Bahaev and I say, could you please help us? We want to organize our own theatrical uh, festival. And uh, we were offered assistance by Tavriski Ihre, by other festivals, but then we decided to be more independent and we organized this event. 
we were trying to invite the best theaters uh, worldwide. And the festival became multifunctional. It is constantly developing. We have a literature platform, educational platform, theatrical program. We convinced uh, Herson people that the theater is so multifaceted that it can exist anywhere, not only in, uh, in the premises of the theater. You know that we have the wood stage. Some performances were performed in churches, in parks, in other buildings. We were trying to convince our people that the theater is, uh, it could be one actor who is performing, it's already a theater. That's why today we don't have obstacles. Uh, we, we have issues, but not obstacles. And we want to reach the heart of the people of Kherson. On the 23rd, um, we were still performing in our theater and we sold tickets on the, for the 24th and the 25th. We were playing a, a performance on four stages simultaneously. It was... Um, uh, a novelty, and um, we promised to our um, spectators that uh, keep your tickets that you had purchased. We are going to use them. We are going to perform. We were trying to send positive messages to our people, and I liked one message in particular. Somebody wrote uh, on our page, uh, I remember that uh, when you were playing Hohol's Pomsta, and I remember my wife was uh, weeping and crying in the theater. And uh, now, when I remember this performance, and uh, when I compare to what's going on right now, it's, it looks like deja vu to me. So, we want to organize the theater so that people remember this year as well, so that they understand that we can't live like that, so we have to change things. The weapon that we have, the people of culture, people of art, our weapon is word. Sometimes word is more powerful when firearms. Your answer is very extensive. You actually covered a lot in one breath. Do we have more questions? If you allow me, I'd like to say a few words about international participants of our festival. You know that the festival has the status of international festival. Uh, we have lots of friends uh, worldwide. And uh, we were traveling to Portugal, Georgia, Romania, Poland, and uh, we were not supported by the government, I mean financially. We were counting on our own efforts. And you know that um, we created this theatrical family, global family, and I'm really pleased uh, that um, some relatives who I have in the Russian Federation, they did not call. We were trying to convince them, we were trying to send them videos. They refused to believe. They said that this was all staged. But I did receive calls from Georgia, Portugal, uh, Poland. They were offering help. They were asking how we were. So that inspired confidence. That inspired us to continue fighting. And this theatrical community, so they were very responsive. They all decided to apply. They are going to talk about Kherson, about Ukraine, about their support and it's very important to spread the word. We've heard you. Andri, what is the city of culture during the war and what is the place of culture during the war? You know that uh, Zankovetska Theater responded momentarily. So we were involved in voluntary activity, and I'm absolutely grateful to our staff, who were actually, all of them, most of them were involved in uh, voluntary activity. A week or so uh, after the war started, we organized volunteer centers, professional volunteer centers. We realized uh, that uh, this initiative 
was absolutely necessary. The Ministry of Culture and the Regional State Administration agreed that we need to continue performing. And I, I support this idea. We are still involved in the vol voluntary activities, but we decided to resume our activities at the theater and uh, continue performing. Because as Alexander said, good words, um, powerful word, uh, funny performance, musical, so might even have a stronger effect than other things. When we resumed uh, our activities and now we are performing, so let's say 50% of our visitors, theater visitors, are people from the East. We are trying to offer ther uh, therapeutical and humanitarian assistance. You can come and you can um, watch our performances uh, and enjoy them. People sometimes forget about um, the nightmares they've been through when they visit our theater. Therefore, As I said, uh, we perform, uh, not daily, but um, we show our performances, um, let's say, periodically. Unfortunately, we cannot perform all, um, uh, we, we cannot show all our performances because some uh, actors were involved in uh, the armed forces, um, in territorial defense units, but they were playing leading roles. That's why we cannot offer all performances. Some of our actors are in the front line, which breaks my heart. But we plan to continue our operations. Uh, we are also visiting uh, hospitals, um, um, other institutions. We are trying to perform for them in order to offer them some joy and comfort in uh, this dire situation. When we were talking about the therapeutic effect of art, when I came to Lviv, uh, Andrew invited me to come and watch their performance. And I physically could feel that people were melting. There were lots of refugees in, uh, in the theater. They were very tense and stiff at the beginning. But by the end of the performance, they melted. So it was actually a therapeutic effect. The place for art is everywhere. In ditches, in the front line, on the street, in hospital, where we can share the word of truth and help people and forget what's happening in uh, Ukraine. So that's the therapeutic effect of art. We have expert counsel of the festival, and today we have Svetlana Maksimenko, who is a Lviv uh, resident. She is celebrating her happy birthday today, so let me, on your behalf, uh, wish her happy birthday. I'm the member of expert council for 20 years already. When you told me that her son is Ukraine, but I understand that her son is a Russian-speaking uh, city, um, I thought that uh, you just had unrealistic ambitions organizing this festival. But when now I see what's happening in Kherson, that people with their bare hands, including women, are trying to stop the military machines and they are sending home those who arrived uh, in tanks, I'm absolutely confident that um, the function of the theater is educational. It's um, to it's therapeutic, is um, also artistic. So Melpomena Tavria is um, the festival that deserves to be um, based in Kherson, because any place that is suitable for performances is used uh, for this purpose. So besides uh, five stages of uh, Kherson, there are also urban stages. Um, 
for example, Zaporozhets Adunayim can be played, uh, can be performed uh, on the river shore. Uh, Portugal uh, theater can be performed in the open air. This is where Ukrainian mentality is born in Ukraine, in Kherson. So this is where the nation is born. Only after 23 years, we understood what the final result is, what festival Melpomene Tavria did, what Ukrainian theater did. This is what we see today. Kherson became the fortress of Ukraine, thanks to Melpomene Tavria. I also wish you a happy birthday and I thank you for this uh, wonderful um, speech that you made at the end of our uh, marathon. I just want to add uh, one thing to what Svetlana said. We did not only create uh, uh, our stages in different locations, but you know that uh, Last year, Vlad Troitsky made my dream come true and we organized the performance in the uh, desert. We sold 1,000 tickets. People came to the desert and we organized uh, this uh, major performance uh, uh, that was 30 years uh, of uh, dedicated to 30 years of our independence. This year, we are trying to go through fire and uh, battle in order to purify our nation, in order to rebear our nation. And I believe that um, once we stay together and once we support each other, we will manage to do anything. Thank you very much, dear guests. Um, Festival, Festival Melpomena Tavria will be organized this year and I wish you every success and I hope that this year, if not this year, and next year for sure, the festival will be back home to Kherson. Uh, we had um, Alexander Kneha, art director of Mykola Kulish Academic Music and Rap, and Andrei Matak, director general.
here to join us in the effort to spread the truth about the situation in Ukraine. Today we will be talking about Mariupol. We have uh, Petro Andrushchenko, advisor to Mariupol mayor. Welcome. Good afternoon. You mentioned that uh, today Russian forces started the ground attack of Azov Stal. We have seen some attacks of strategic aviation. There were very powerful uh, attacks, bombing, shelling, people saw smoke. And I understand the situation is very, very difficult. So after shelling, most likely they will start ground attacks, but they do it daily. And we keep following the situation and we hope that it will resolve sometime soon. I just wanted to make sure we heard you correctly. The ground attack that is happening today, it's not the new thing. Similar things were happening in the past. They are actually happening daily because the territory of this facility is huge. They are trying to break through the facility. They are trying to find, um, to break into the facility. They are trying to find the underground uh, premises. They are trying to find the hospital, this field hospital that was organized uh, in one of the shelters. Irina Barishchuk mentioned that uh, now they are in the process of negotiations of the second stage of evacuation of uh, the wounded, the military and civilians. Do you know anything about that? Um, as the negotiations are still ongoing and the Ministry of Reintegration is in charge, we can't comment anything because we don't want to hinder, we don't want to um, create any obstacles. What is the situation in the city besides Azovstal? The situation is threatening according to us because on one side we see the number of people is growing because people are getting back because all green corridors were closed by the Russian Federation. People who were residing in uh, Nikopolsk, Bardyansk, uh, Mariupol, uh, regions, so they cannot get to Zaporizhia, and because of financial uh, challenges, they are forced to go back to their homes. So we see that the number of people is increasing. Unfortunately, uh, the delivery of food still remains a big challenge. Russian troops resumed uh, water supply. There were a lot of um, utility lines damaged, but uh, it, it is also very dangerous because there might be humanitarian disaster. The problem of uh, water waste and uh, drainage is uh, absolutely threatening because all this uh, drainage uh, will end up in the sea eventually. There is also a huge amount of people uh, whose bodies are still under the debris and no one is burying them. So that is also um, a big threat because it can lead to epidemics in the city because by the end of this year we might have 10,000 people dead because of humanitarian catastrophe. The situation is very threatening, so the situation is absolutely dire. People cannot leave uh, the city because of uh, <coughs> green corridors being blocked. We have a question from our guest. Do you have any connection with people in Azovstal? Uh, can you help the wounded? Um, can you provide them with uh, food and medication? I cannot comment.
because the security and safety issues is above all. Any other questions? A more generic question. Oh. It's been almost three years since the war started. We can already make some conclusions about the plans of Russia regarding Mariupol, Donbass, and Ukraine in general. So what are your thoughts? Mariupol is a very demonstrative example because what we hear from the Russians, from collaborators, from their surrounding, they don't need Mariupol as such. No one is trying to improve the humanitarian situation in Mariupol. For them, it's just geographical location on the map. They cannot resume the port because it's very uh, labor and financially and time consuming process. So it's going to be converted into ghetto. And the absence of occupational core means that they will probably marginalize the population. They will just uh, organize gangs that will be controlling the city. Unfortunately, this is the most pessimistic, the worst case scenario. But that's according to us. We also saw that there were attempts to legalize this occupational regime. They were trying to even organize the referendum. They were even mentioning the date of the referendum, the 15th of May. But now I see that um, they're trying to strengthen the reintegration of Mariupol into Russia. They are already integrating their system with the mobile connection of Russia. Uh, we know that uh, Russian banks are trying to enter Mariupol. Educational system has been converted into, um, it has been um, organized in line with the Russian Ministry of Education. So hopefully that all will end well. So. Um, they say that uh, Mariupol is fully occupied. Um, I believe that the annexation of Mariupol will be done without legal grounds. So I understand that first they were trying to get port, but port is not working. I cannot hear you, unfortunately. I will repeat that initially they wanted port, but now they understand that they uh, that, that the port is uh, difficult to rebuild and um, resume uh, the, the operations in the port. So they are going to convert it into ghetto. That is correct. Uh, they are trying to attack Azov Stal, Azov Steel, a military facility. So what are the reasons that they keep attacking this facility and they keep spending so much time? Is this just to satisfy the sick ambitions of Putin? We can compare this situation to what happened uh, in Kyiv or near Kyiv. They were trying to capture the city in three or four days. They understand that it's very difficult to withdraw their troops because they created this uh, propaganda circle around Azov Steel. They cannot attack it, they cannot capture it, but they cannot withdraw. So this is basically a vicious circle for them. I understand that they are also sustaining losses. Yes, daily. So daily they are losing their soldiers. It doesn't make any sense uh, for the Russians to continue. Even if they are ready to take all their forces away, we, we can uh, guarantee that uh, these are the best soldiers that we have in Azov. At the moment, uh, you cannot reach any agreement with Russians. We can't. We, we just keep hoping. The hope is the last thing. So I understand uh, what you say. Thank you for finding the opportunity to be with us. And thank you for what you are doing for Mariupol and for Ukraine. We, our guest was um, Petro Andrushchenko, advisor to Mariupol mayor. My name is Vadim Krasnov.
My name is Vadim Krasnolke, Media Center, Ukraine. Greetings to all journalists who join us in an effort to share the truth about the most outst outstanding events in Ukraine. Today we will be talking about Poltava Oblast. We have Dmitry Lunin, head of Poltava Oblast Military State Administration. Welcome, Dmitry. Welcome. Yesterday and the day before, Poltava sustained probably the biggest attack um, in three months, the war period. There were 12 uh, bombings in uh, Kremenchuk. Two were destroyed by our um, air defense units. Kremenchuk power plant unfortunately was damaged. Uh, luckily, nobody was wounded or injured or died but the damage caused to our infrastructure is huge we sustained another attack last month in april and we haven't managed to resume to uh, the operations of the infrastructural objects that were damaged back then and 170 thousand people of Kremenchu who were receiving the heat supply from this power plant, uh, unfortunately, were made to freeze because uh, they couldn't get heat. We know that uh, Kremenchu um, oil refinery was also damaged uh, because of the bombing and uh, it didn't work did it make any sense to attack it again do you think that they were probably targeting any other object but uh, um, decided to attack it again no these are very precise high precision weapon and they targeted this very infrastructural facility I can assure you. Speaking of the Russian Federation, we cannot see logic or sense in many things they do. I believe all they do in Ukraine makes no sense at all. And it's difficult to find any logic in those attacks, in those rocket strikes. So the only thing uh, they do, they, they just keep destroying the remains of the industrial facility that is no longer in operation. I understand. Good news is that uh, people did not suffer, so nobody got injured. Poltava is now the forepost between Kharkiv and Donbass, and uh, these are the two places with the most active hostilities. So could you Give us an update uh, how Oblast lives uh, in such conditions. We are a humanitarian hub for Sumshchana, Donetshchana, Luhanshchana. We have uh, 200,000 refugees officially registered in our region. Our main objective is to help Sumy and Kharkiv region with humanitarian assistance, uh, hundreds of tons, hundreds of thousands of tons of humanitarian relief arrived in uh, Poltava region. We pack uh, uh, food um, and we deliver it to um, the refugees. 75% of refugees who now live in Poltava region are from Kharkiv and Kharkiv region. So our main objective is to render support to those regions that suffer from the most active hostilities. What are the recent trends? Uh, do you think that Har people from Kharkiv uh, uh, had uh, for home? Or is there evacuation from Donbass? There is no mass evacuation from Donbass. Unfortunately, people from Kharkiv remain in Poltava region. They don't want to go home yet. We know that our armed forces of Ukraine are already succeeding in the north of Kharkiv, but people are still cautious about going home. Amongst other things, uh, we provide medical assistance to a lot of military who arrive from the south of our country and Kharkiv region. So we provide medical assistance to our military in our hospitals and medical facilities. Being so close to active hostilities, how does it affect your daily life and routine? I mean, uh, Poltava region's daily life and routine. 
you probably know that the situation is more or less stable here. Uh, people are getting used to living in such conditions. They are near the front line. They keep living their lives. They keep working, uh, uh, providing services. Um, retail uh, businesses keep working. So people keep receiving the services they are used to. But nevertheless, uh, air raid alarms keep reminding us that um, the war is going on. You know that there were attacks on Karlivka and Kremenchuk last week. Uh, so it keeps reminding us that the war is going on and we should not become complacent. We should not ignore air raid warnings and we should be cautious and careful. I understand that we need to keep living, but we should not be complacent, as you put it. How do you rebuild the Poltava region after the attacks? How are you trying to rebuild? Um, we didn't have active hostilities in our region. There were some in the north. Um, the Russian troops were trying to enter some of our communities. They ruined the bridges. We ruined the bridges, I apologize, uh, so that we can stop the forwarding of Russian troops so that they couldn't attack uh, the south of Sumy region and the north of Poltava region. You probably know about the Hadjach Safari. So that's a local, um, let's say, inside joke. Uh, our law enforcement were trying to confiscate the tanks and the machinery of the Russian troops, and they were kicking them out of there. Unfortunately, we haven't managed to rebuild a lot because rebuilding bridges, it's um, expensive and time-consuming work. So we are now assessing the damage, the scope of damage. Uh, our most important thing is that we can provide hot water and uh, heat to the buildings of um, uh, and homes of our uh, people. Because we cannot be sure that uh, situation will not repeat. As we already said, that it doesn't make any sense to bombard the facility that is already destroyed, but uh, where are we looking for logic for? Speaking of Poltava infrastructure, I know that uh, some roads uh, were damaged and destroyed, but um, other infrastructural objects are intact. Yes, we can put it that way. So our infrastructure hasn't suffered, luckily. There were some damages caused to our airport, uh, and there were some uh, strikes uh, in um, Poltavshina region, uh, one farm was ruined. A few infrastructural objects of minor importance were ruined, but they will be rebuilt soon. Let's talk about the economic situation in the region. Agrarian situation, um, have you started sowing campaign? Are you in the middle of it? No, we are actually on final stages of our sowing campaign. Um, 1,200 hectares have already been cultivated and uh, um, altogether our objective was uh, 1,400 uh, uh, hectares. Unfortunately, a lot of damage was caused to our economy and it's very difficult uh, to work in such conditions because we have shortage of fuel. But speaking of other sectors of industry, such as retail, trade, commerce. So things are more or less um, good, satisfactory, because there are lots of refugees living in our region and they are using the services. Speaking of the budget, uh, for the first time in four months, we have positive figures in the budget. Not in all communities, territorial communities, unfortunately. We have... Um, a lot of um, natural resources and um, uh, businesses related to, uh, to natural resources. And those industries that are working in that sector, so they are doing pretty well and the budget of, this, of those communities is quite balanced. In other communities, um, we made 60% um, of our revenues uh, 
but the situation is more or less stable. We should not be complaining if we compare our situation with other regions of Ukraine. Unfortunately, heavy industry is not doing as well because uh, the chain supplies have been uh, disrupted. Speaking of agricultural sector, a lot of um, produce remains in our um, stocks. Um, we were planning to sell it to other countries, uh, so but um, unfortunately, this, these products are sitting in our warehouses. In a nutshell, the situation is under control, and I believe that we will not be suffering from starvation, so that's for sure. So that's good news, that the economics is good, it's up and running, and uh, the situation is under control. Do we have questions? Recently, Russia hit... Um, oil refinery in Kremenchuk. Actually, there were a few rocket strikes that were delivered recently, and uh, this facility is not working at the moment. What is uh, the volume of um, the trade done by this oil refinery um, in relation to the market figures of Ukraine? And I understand that this is the crisis situation. 20 to 30 percent of um, fuel, so that was what our refinery provided before the war. But we also uh, have issues with ports that they are not working, and uh, as we said, uh, supply chains were disrupted, and there are logistical issues, and uh, we are short of fuel. So some of the economy, economy sectors were ruined, but the biggest situation, the biggest problem is about the ports, that the ports are not functioning. If we have no more questions, then uh, we will be saying thank you to our guest. Thank you, Dmitro, for being with us, and thank you for doing what you are doing for Poltava region and uh, Ukraine. Let me just remind you that our guest was Dmitro Lunin, head of Poltava Oblast Military Ad State Administration, and my name is Vadim Kuhn.